Unbound Bodies, Artist Spotlight, take two. Uh, I'm Simone John. I use she, her pronouns. My practices include writing, writing poetry. I have altar practices that are really important to me and uh, creative placemaking, mischief making mm -hmm. with these books. G, Diaz y Rodriguez. I use a she, her pronouns. I consider myself to be a community organizer, cultural organizer, builder, and, and use all kinds of creative ways to, to, to do that, to build relationships um, in a different kind of way mm -hmm. in community, mm -hmm. and specifically as our practice with Unbound Bodies. Hi, I'm Bashizo. Uh, it's easier they, them pronouns. I feel like I'm practicing life. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like this is this is quite a journey. I hold space for folks, space with care for specifically queer and trans, black and brown folks. I'm a performance artist. I'm a conceptual artist. I'm an object maker. Um, I'm a dreamer. I'm a mischief maker for sure. Mm -hmm. I do like to cause some trouble. Hi, I'm JD Stokely or Jess Stokely is fine. I use they, them, and he, him pronouns. Theater maker, performance maker, curator, and a um, yeah, community organizer. I am a student, so a budding scholar. I call myself a Ooh. trickster in training. Yes. <laughs> um, I think a lot about public space and who can gather and how we gather um, and what it means to be in public, seeing, seeing each other together. And I also think a lot about questions. So I have a, a strong kind of gravitation towards questions as a practice. I'm Kamaria, they, them pronouns. My practice these days, I think conjuring, is like opening up all the channels I can for blackness and brownness to like pour through, mm -hmm. doing some world building and sometimes like otherworldly building, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think liberation is a practice. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, bringing yeah. forward through myself and through my people as much as possible the ways we want to be and we deserve to be in the world as yeah. queer and trans, black and brown people taking up f***ing sacred ass, blessed ass space. Where did the dream come from for Unbound Bodies? Um, I just come from Philadelphia and I really was craving performance space and someone named Moya Bailey was like, you have to meet these two people, Bashizo and Kamaria. So I just want to say there was mm -hmm. there was a little seed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, even before it was just us two talking yeah. about it. We got introduced and we just started talking about what we were longing for, um, what wasn't here, um, and that being kind of collective space, experimental black queer space, um, curated space, improvisational play space, and I think we were just like let's. Let's start it. And actually what we're doing is we're kind of uncover, uncovering mm. the roots underneath that are actually, that have been connecting all of this work mm. for years, for decades. Yeah. The work has been erased. The history of that work has been erased. People mm -hmm. have been doing this work. Yeah, so I think our formation in some ways as a collective really reflects the ways that um, our events are mm. kind of reflecting mm -hmm. the history and the legacy of uh, QT BIPOC art in, yeah. in Boston. Mm -hmm. Roots and Futures was like a dream from my, and a gift from my ancestors. And mm -hmm. as a way to kind of not only feed my spirit and heal like from trauma, my own trauma, their trauma, but also to celebrate like black joy and black queer joy while recognizing that we couldn't be a collective in this city without all the dope ass people who were here mm -hmm. before us. One of the most beautiful things about this project to me is that it's so anti-isolation. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's yes. anti-isolation. Yes. It's it's yeah. it amplifies our connection to each yeah. other mm -hmm. and the community kind of network connections, the the roots that are underneath the surface yeah. that we're helping to uncover. Yeah. I think that work is important in general for healing. What is Unbound's role in your knowing of your own self? Um, <laughs> I definitely I think have learned um, how to come into like what to love the parts of myself that responded in ways that 
don't serve me anymore, mm. but to, to still love those parts mm. Mm. Um, because they did serve me at some point and they got me here. Mm. And also I can still say it, I can be different now. Mm. And I think I've, I would have never come to that had people not shown me that, mm. had y'all not loved me mm. in the different ways. I feel like y'all have really emboldened my no mm. and empowered my no in a way that I appreciate. I have a no within, you know, I have myself and black people in me who have like a no bull policy or who are mm -hmm. clear. And I think that moving through this wild ass world, so many things try to turn the volume down on that mm -hmm. or like condition mm -hmm. you to push through mm -hmm. or ignore a no. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that feels like mm -hmm. uh, a gift and that I can stand in my no and trust that no and trust that y'all that the invitation to have boundaries and to to be authentic is a real one and that we mm -hmm. can hold that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's good? I'm Dominic Diggity Dom Glad, and my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a trans male. I currently own and run Diggity Dom Entertainment LLC, where I provide recording, mixing, production, and drumming. I also teach music technology as well as drum lessons. Also, a HIV outreach specialist, Boston Glass. I'd say my passion for music came from my parents for sure. Like, my mom did a musical, she wrote a whole musical and was, like, teaching it and stuff while she was having me in her stomach, and dad plays keys, my mom plays keys and sings, and, like, grew up in the church. Now, in addition to everything, you're an entrepreneur, how would you say that journey started? My mom, pretty much, she teaches piano and voice lessons. Watching her drive, like, trying to always do this and that for her business, she started an internet radio station, like, I was in her kids' band that she was running and like all these different adventures and like I would help her out with a lot of stuff, even like burning CDs, putting the labels on, packaging them up, just being around that environment and like the hustle, like it started to rub off on me. How would you say that your being inspired by your mom has impacted your relationship with her and impacted your experience individually and your identity? It was very tough in the beginning because you know, I grew up in the church, Christian background. It was very hard because I want to be called different pronouns. I want to go by a different name. And for all this time, she's known me as a different name. She's known me as a different pronoun. And it was really rough for her. It was rough for my dad. It was rough for my brother. And then like in school, in high school, I changed my name in the BPS system. We had a tipping point, right? Where I could have moved out because she didn't want me to transition under her roof. That she realized, oh shit, I love you enough to realize like, I don't want you to be suffering alone out there in the streets. But I needed her to understand. I need you to respect me because I can't, I won't stay here under that emotional turmoil. Now where I feel like, yeah, we have tension when I when she wants me to wash the dishes, but like, it's like at the end of the day, like she supports me, she loves me. How do you balance it all? How do you balance family, work, school, personal time? It's a struggle. When I first came out, I dealt with depression by being busy. Now I'm doing a lot of things that I want and love, but there's so much, so many things happening at once that I have to turn, I have to start turning things down. I'm trying my hardest to try to get ahead of things. I need to get more sleep. I need to eat more consistently. I'm trying to eat better. Now I'm working on like investing more time into myself, my self care. What are some hopes that you have for the future? I want to grow my business so large that I can provide jobs for people like us. I want to have a building where I can have studios and dance spaces and, you know, recording spaces and all this stuff. I also want to be able to have scholarships down the line. What would you say brings you peace? Sleep is great. I don't get enough of it, but I love to sleep. Also, like, my girl, like, yo, she's my rock. We've been together for, like, like a little over three and a half years now going on hikes nature walks and like just being around people that i love what does pride extended mean to you as a black trans person first of all i just feel so blessed to know you oh yeah i feel blessed to be a part of this there's so many trans people that are really suffering that can really like use these resources that can really benefit from some of the things that you're trying to do and that are, that you are doing 
letting people know, like, yeah, we f exist. Hi, my name is Jacoby, and I go by he, him, his, and um, currently, well, trying to finish my bachelor's degree in criminal justice with a minor in sociology, and I have a small business that pertains to catering, balloon work, all that type of stuff. The name of my business is JDW Planning, not an official business yet, business name yet, but I'm working on that. Desserts, balloon work, parties, um, all those types of things, you name it, I probably can do it. I think my passion definitely comes from my grandmother because I always used to be in the kitchen with her all the time, cooking, making cakes and all that type of stuff. And definitely during family reunion times, we would always be cooking, baking. How would you say that entrepreneurship has impacted your life? Some time to definitely jot down some things, to work on myself, definitely financial responsibility as well. Because you can't have a business without a business plan. I started voguing officially in 2019, I think, in Paris. Started watching ball clips in like 2012. I was like probably 13, I think, 14, one of those ages. Ballroom definitely is the set and the standard to a lot of things from fashion to um, traveling to getting to know people, meet people. It's definitely given me some type of time to kind of break out of my shell, but I'm still trying to get there. Try to extend it means to me someone who is able to express himself in a manner that people can see them trying to express himself and gain the courage that they need to show others that they're truly themselves and hopefully help others become themselves as well. Just try to be yourself even if you are in an uncomfortable situation, but be 100% you and yeah. Nas Artist Spotlight, take one. Hi, my name is Nazir Rakim. I go by he, him, and I'm an all-around creative and artist. My passion for design and creating comes from my life. Hardships and all that, it leads you to have to be more creative and more resourceful in life, and I've always been a person that just put it together. I grew up in Roxbury, so a lot of what I'm surrounded by besides art is people going through addiction, um, poverty, um, experiencing that myself, hungry days and nights, basically living a destitute lifestyle. And I didn't necessarily care about the things I didn't have versus the things that I could create. What brings me peace mostly in life, honestly, is creating. It's probably the only thing I have in life to balance me to give me some form of like what I feel is purpose, but at the same time, which isn't forced. It's just natural and it gives me everything I need without taking from me. Pride extended to me as a black trans man means caring, uplifting, and acknowledging my community all year round, every day of the year, 24 seven. I think for a lot of people, Pride is something that happens once a year, particularly during Pride Month. But for most people like me that are black and trans, it's every day because it's something that we never run from or hide, it's a part of our life. So Pride Extended is about living and being true to that all year round. What are some hopes you have for the future? My number one hope is that the world becomes a better place overall, but mostly and purposely for the benefit of black trans people to be able to live and not just live, but to thrive in society. There's so many people like me that deserve a opportunity. It's not just about us existing, but being able to be a part of life without any repercussions or regards or fears. Art has saves my life. Don't know what I would be doing if I wasn't doing art, if I wasn't creating. I don't think that I would have any direction in my life without art. It has made me a better person. It has led me into spaces that I probably wouldn't have even thought of. Anything else you want to leave? If I could leave off on any note, I would just say protect black trans women. That's it.
Hi, everybody. Um, let me know if y'all can see and hear me by like giving a thumbs up or something or some kind of reaction. Okay. I can see you and hear you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending our future. Um, I'm very excited for this panel. It is a panel that is we're in conversation with Black trans women and femmes um, about what the role of storytelling and community is in the work that we do. So I'm very, very, very excited. Um, one announcement that I do have is that we are going to be recording. So if you do not wish to be recorded, please be sure to turn your cameras off. Um, I'm very excited for the panelists that we have here. Um, these are folks that are near and dear to me. Um, and yes, without further ado, I'm going to just um, casually announce, as the casual person that I am, um, the people that we have, Daiki Garrell. Um, and I can also- Hello, everyone. Um, Daiki Garrell is a PhD student at the University of Washington, Washington, Seattle. Her work is rooted in addressing the socio-political issues that affect the lives of Black trans women across the country, such as homelessness, food scarcity, and genocide. By combining the stories and lived experiences of Black trans women with her academic studies in environmental racism, technology, and climate change, Daiki's goal is to help create an Afro-trans femme future and a future that isn't predicated on surviving a genocide, but is rooted in thriving and creating a sustainable future for Black trans women. So everyone, welcome Daiki. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me. It's so exciting. I'm so excited to get to uh, talk with y'all about all the amazing things. Of course. And then next we have Noelle Delion. Noelle is an interdisciplinary artist and archivist. She studies social work, Vogue, Black art, and Black trans history. The work that she does centers the lives and lineage of Black trans women in and outside of ballroom, which she has titled Femme Queen Archive. So without further ado, y'all welcome Noelle. Oh, I'm so excited. Hello, everyone. Hello. So, First, um, I gave a little bit about, you know, y'all's work and who y'all are, but if y'all could just introduce yourselves, um, say, you know, your name, your pronouns, and what it is that you do in your words. Should I start it? Okay. I'll, start uh, it. Hi, <laughs> hi, my name is Daiki Garrell. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, uh, you know, I feel like my work, I, I'm also driving right now, so it's, it's going to be a lot going on. If it gets too loud or if my sound goes out, let me know. But um, my work definitely um, centers uh, uh, Black trans women <clears throat> as it pertains to like trying to understand and live in a future outside of these conceptions around death that we experience here so often um, in our world. And so one of the things that I love to do with my brain of mine and think about is like the uh, try to think about like the ways in which technology, um, the ways in which technology kind of um, interferes uh, with the lives of Black trans women as, as well, like, you know, for the betterment, but also for, um, uh, you know, just understanding sustainable futures in the midst of environmental issues that we experience in this world today. Um, my work definitely like tries to get at the heart of trying to put black trans women back into a society as human, you know, like as a people, as a population of people who like experience the world in all of its political facets, but also in its natural ones as well. Thank you. And next, Noel, you can go and then I'm gonna introduce our third panelist. Okay. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Noel DeLeon. Uh, the work that I do center, centers around social work of uh, Black trans history, Vogue, and life for trans women in and outside of ballroom. So what I showcase is um, film queen performance. This year, film queen performance that was pioneered by uh, Black trans women and life in and outside of that realm. Thank y'all so much. Our third and final panelist is <clears throat> Desi Hall. Desi Hall is a Black trans Nashville-based organizer, nonprofit professional, consultant, lecturer, podcaster, but 
and I can attest to the podcast, um, budding theologian and a self-described Beyonce historian. Currently, she attends Vanderbilt Divinity School, where she is an MTS candidate. She's been awarded the Marsha P. Johnson Freedom Award, the J. Lawrence Brasher Award for Excellence in the Study of Religion, and recognized by Congresswoman Terry Sewell for her work on the Young Women's Initiative. So in addition to that, um, Desi, if you could just introduce yourself, um, let us know your name, your pronouns, and in your words, what it is that you do a little bit more. Yeah, thank you. So sorry I was late. I was having some problems with my internet. Um, but I am so happy to be here with y'all. My name is Desi Hall. Um, and also that is Atlanta-based organizer now. I am no longer Nashville-based, so. Um, and uh, pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm the founder and one of the executive directors of the Francis Thompson Education Foundation, um, where we are an organization working to make higher education accessible for Black trans students. Um, all of us and all of our founders have been through or are still in higher education institutions and recognize the sheer number of barriers that stop us from not just entering but staying in school um because so many girls go to school so many uh trans folks and non-binary folks go to school but never finish so, so um one of our priorities is retention as well um so that is the majority of our work and we are also planning to launch a black a, a all black trans academic journal um so more announcements on that in the later in the last quarter of this year um but that is my work and i'm desi hall <laughs> thank you for that so i'm so excited to have y'all on y'all already know this um, I'm gonna get right into it. The first question, and we can do a popcorn style, like whoever you know feels inclined can answer first. There's no particular order. Um, where did the passion for your work come from? Honestly, um, just from my experience, like undergrad was hell for me. Um, I had so few resources. There were so many times where I almost had to quit due to financial reasons um, or stuff going on back home. Um, so just that experience alone and then, you know, searching for resources and not finding anything devoted to people like me. Um, not anything that is specific to my Black transness and doesn't ask me to bear out my trauma um, to prove that I need money and to prove that I need funding. Um, so that's one of the things that drives me and inspired me about, into this work. Work. Pause real quick. I just realized I did not introduce myself. No shade. My name is Mercedes. <laughs> I'm an outreach PA at Boston Glass and um, I'm a creative writer and filmmaker and um, I'm excited to be here. I'm like, girl, you did not introduce yourself. Um, <laughs> be her pronouns. So yeah, let's get back into it. <laughs> I think I came into my work um, when like um, in STEM programs, like there are, because uh, like you, Desi, listen, undergrad was hell too. I hated it, you know, for so many things. I met some of my like favorite people in the world there, but overall, like, uh, you know, it was really, really, really hard to like exist as a black trans woman in, in, in that space. But one of the things that I will say is my work around technology and like um, the environment and like futures in that way, I don't see in STEM programs at all, not even in the history programs that I did in undergrad, like people center black trans women in future. You know, whenever people would talk about the future as it pertained, whether they was talking about political worlds, you know, um, you know, I also come from like a black radical tradition as it pertains to like uh, uh, studies. So like, you know, I come from like, you know, black history backgrounds and in black history, no one talks about the lived political experiences of transgender people, you know, and no one talks about what does it mean to fight for the liberation of black people and what does it mean to like see black trans women in a future that exists in a way that is beyond like uh, the confines of death, like, you know, and so for me in my studies, I want to build worlds that exist under oceans. I want to build cities that exist in skies. I want to 
develop and design worlds where black trans women float, fly, do whatever the hell they want. Because at the end of the day, like we deserve to see ourselves everywhere and anywhere, you know, um, in all capacities. Well said, well said. So the, um, my inspiration behind the work that I do, um, in the beginning processes of me stepping into my transness, I was searching for individuals and spaces that could reaffirm who I was and who could bring me closer to the history and just uh, the lineage of my existence. So when I discovered um, Fem Queen performance and you know just Fem Queen face and you know all of that, it uh, it let me know that I was on the right path. So stepping deeper into who I was and learning more and more about my community and my history, when I learned how to vogue, um, just the, the 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 black trans women who who laid the foundation for what I do, it just it spoke to me. So I wanted to I wanted to showcase what they did and also put what I was doing and the work that I do into what they had already done, you know? So that was, that was the inspiration for what I do. And now um, I've, it's been one year since I've been archiving a Femme Queen performance. And now I'm taking it to more um, broader and just a, a bigger platform and a space. So, so yeah, like the, it's been, it's been such a great journey because these, some of these women aren't here anymore. And the fact that I get to tell their stories and I get to show the world what they did, it's just, it's everything to me, you know? I felt that. I feel like oftentimes people forget about just the struggles um, that our mere existence and being, um, especially as it pertains to ballroom, because, right. you right. know, as you know, like lately ballroom has been like, um much more visible mm -hmm. than before um but i always say that like visibility is definitely like a double-edged sword in the mm -hmm. fact that like you end up having people telling stories that they don't know anything about um or you have people telling stories without getting in contact with people from the scene right um, so right so that's a big thing for me and that's why i love that work so much i feel like archiving is like a very, very um, underrepresented um, form of work, but I think it's very important, especially as it pertains to black trans women. Right. Um, the next question is, what have you learned about community through your work? I can, um, I can actually put mm. on my analyst hat and um, <laughs> um, <laughs> for uh -huh. me, um, Community, I feel like I'm always realizing again and again and again the different layers of community and the different intersections of community, mm -hmm. um, which is why this panel is so special to me because it's not just a ballroom panel and it's not just a tech or STEM panel and it's not just a religion panel, um, but it's a panel with people, black trans women who are doing vastly different things, but somehow we have the common thread, which is community, which is storytelling, which is existence, which is um, sustainability, which is our futures. Um, so for me, my thing is just like constantly learning and relearning community and what that means. Um, and I don't even know if I have a firm definition of what community is because it shows up in so many different um, places, like the smallest things um, mm -hmm. or what seems like the smallest things, such as like crowdfunding and stuff like that. Like that's to me, like that's when community shows up. Community is like when you're in the trenches, when you're in the inner city communities, AKA the hood, when you're doing, you know, the work um, and using language that is like very accessible for people um, and not really, not throwing the books away, but also not throwing the books at people who don't really understand the books. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. You know, listen, mira, mira, mira. That is real, real, real. That's so real. I feel like there's so many things. What, what, listen, one of the things I stay telling people, I, I, skin folk ain't kinfolk, you know, like, and one of the things I had to remember 
is that my community is the people who show up for me. You know, my community is the people mm -hmm. who are with me in all times and in moments where I need them. So for example, there was this time um, in Philadelphia, you know, uh, I, listen, I'm an academic, I do research, I go and do a lot of things, you know, and that don't mean I'm not a black trans woman while I'm doing these things, you know, I exist in this world still. But, you know, I'm talking about designing technologies, online platforms for um, uh, trans, trans people at, at that particular time to like develop and design like, you know, their own experiences online and stuff like that. Me and um, Mercedes, loving Manly, we were in um, Philadelphia, um, the good Philly, and we were getting food, you know, at, uh, at, a, at a nice place. We got some Spanish food and people was acting a fool the entire time we was getting food and so we had to step you know excuse me we had to step we had to step to him we had to get with him you know quick you know it was a it was a it, it, it was it was quick but it was something that was important for me in that particular moment because it because I realized like even when on a study about design and technology for the future literally I had to defend myself against the present violences that are so present in my life, you know, that I couldn't escape a past in order to get to a future. But what I could do is address it with people I love. And so for me, it meant that moving forward in the future means having community with me now so that I could get to the future, you know, period. You know, like I, I, I need, I needed, I needed Mercedes in that moment and Mercedes needed me and we was there for each other and it was an amazing time. You know, it didn't even ruin our week. We had an amazing week. You know, it was great. And uh... <laughs> you know, I think for me, something, especially like in my uh, academic work um, as a theologian and research, I found just how much of a commitment community requires. Um, because I mean, there are going to be so many moments where people who you're in community with will do things that you don't align with or um, you don't think is right, but it's like, how am I still going to care about your survival in that moment? How am I still going to be invested in you not dying? Um, which for some is a very simple, way a simple question um simple answer um but for others it's very hard um so i i think i yeah i just realized that uh you have to be really committed to this community shit for it to work and be recommitted and be willing to lose that commitment and find it again um yeah because it's 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 so complicated and can be so stressful but also uh rewarding For me, um, community is connection. You know, I've I've never been more connected to uh, to individuals who understand me than before before I got to this space of transes. You know, I've never understood friendship got to this space. You know. My, my trans sisters, my trans brothers, and just everyone who has supported me and support with me, I've never had that. I've never, I've never had the chance to, to, ju to just really sit with love and understanding and support than the community that I'm that I'm in. You get what I mean? So for me, community uh, is connection. Like uh, Desi said, um, a lot of the times, the people you are in community with, you don't align with what they do. And for me, that that's something that I've had to to learn these past few months. Although you know, everyone in your and your community won't align with you, the ones that do, you have to hold on to them. You have to, you have to hold on 
to to the love to the connection because that's that's what's going to sustain you in this space you know we all need especially trans people we all need that that love and that support but when it's genuine you know what i mean because all the time community it won't be genuine it won't be it won't be love it won't be any of that but when you have it hold on to it and i'm glad that i've been able to hold on to what serves me well love that now how would y'all say y'all balance community and self and where does self show up in community if at all because i'm not gonna lie to you i struggle with it um i think i think i can label myself a giver like i'm very much like you know, I don't, I try not to really like ask for much. I try to just like support others. Cause I'm just like, why would I not? Um, and then I get to these instances where I like have to remind myself the importance of sustaining me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I struggle with it. I do. I think that I've been conditioned to struggle with it. Um, because as black people, as black trans people, um, you know, like we're not supposed to, you know, be able to even be in positions to really support people, um, never mind ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely something I struggle with. So I'm interested in hearing some of y'all's outlook on that. Um, For me, I definitely uh, resonate with everything that you said. Um, So much of my life has been lived to give to others. I didn't really pour into myself before I stepped into my transness and it kind of forced me to, to be selfish, you know, um, selfish, not in a way that I forget to be there for others, but selfish in a way that I always remember that my, my life and my wellness and my, my health always comes first before anything, because how am I going to give and show up for others if I can't show up for myself? you know so much of so much of what I do is is rooted in community so I always have to make sure I have like a clear distinction between what I do for myself and what I do for my community but a lot of times they intertwine Mm -hmm. so I think now I'm learning a balance between both those two so it's it's touch and go, you know. I I always say we have to take life one day at a time because that's really all we can do. I feel like us as trans people, we put so much expectation on ourselves and how we um, perform and how we live, mm-hmm. and taking it one day at a time um, that sets us up for just just progress and just much more opportunities to just to just exist, you know? I try to, I, I've i been trying to live in the present instead of focusing on the future so much, which I think we, you know, it's it's normal to focus on the future and to make sure we have everything lined up. But sometimes I think we forget to just exist in the now, you know? Definitely, I felt that, definitely. If this past year hasn't taught me anything else, it's taught me to, Breathe and just live in a moment, child. What happened tomorrow is what's going to happen tomorrow, but Mm -hmm. do this right now. Thank you. And I think, too, something that's been so critical for me um, in balancing community and myself is, um, one, like getting super clear on my needs. Um, And uh, Noel, you said perform, which is such a perfect word. because if I'm clear on my needs, I won't have to perform around people in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we can really invest in each other. Um, And I think, you know, boundary setting with self and boundary setting with others is so key to um, functioning well in a community and getting comfortable with the fact that um, Sometimes shit will go wrong. Sometimes Mm -hmm. things, um, there will be misunderstandings. There'll be um, arguments. Um, 
but just being committed to those boundaries that you said and committed to the love and committed to why you want the community, the support that you want. Um, but yeah, like just being super clear on um, what I need has been very important for me functioning in community well and being able to hold people accountable for how they treat me. Um, because, you know, I, at this point I can say, you know, I clearly communicated that this is what I need. Um, this is how I operate in relations. This is, this, this is what I expect. Um, so when I communicate that up front, it, it's very, it's much easier to be able to let things go, let people go. Um, it's much easier to, um, yeah, to just hold people accountable because there will be people who you will communicate those needs, those um, boundaries upfront with, and they will instantly honor them. Um, and once you experience that, it's just like, it, it changes things up for you. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you hear me? Um, yeah, like uh, for me, I definitely, I feel like for me, I've been taking care of people since I was a kid, you know, like uh, I've been taking care of my brothers and sisters. Um, I've been taking care of, you know, business. I remember when I was young, I, uh, you know, when my mom would, you know, I didn't know where she was or like, you know, something was happening or whatever. And my sisters had like a parent conference, for example. I would be the one at the parent conference, me and my sister Nisha. And we would be, you know, my baby sister's quote unquote parents for that particular time. And we would be listening to our teachers say all this stuff, you know, and we were like that much older, you know, we were like maybe four or five years older. So maybe 13, 14 years old. And our sister was like uh, in single digit ages, you know? And I remember like uh, growing up all the time, like uh, being relegated to a particular like uh, care labor, you know? Um, and I think as I got older, um, like it didn't necessarily go away. It actually just expanded into chosen family, you know? And so like, I started like centering and taking care of people who needed it, who expressed it, who, you know, I found genuine connection with. And I think like, like you, Mercy, or like you, Mercedes, I like, um, you know, have like a hard time currently trying to figure out how to take care of myself in that, you know? And I think like, one of the, my biggest things that I'm always like critiquing my own self about is like when I'm by myself and I'm trying to do something for myself or trying to, you know, relax, my, my mind immediately goes to someone else, you know? And it's like, oh my God, are they okay? What's going on here? I remember they said this the other day. I wonder if they're okay. Let me call them up real quick. You know, it ain't gonna take that long. And then I get into a three hour long conversation with somebody and there goes my like self care for that I was supposed to be doing, you know? And so it gets extremely overwhelming because I feel like, oftentimes like people need my attention, but a part of me have constructed myself in that way, you know? And so trying to figure out how to deconstruct myself and like reconstruct myself into someone that I want to be, not just for other people, but for myself as well. I love that, especially what you said at the end about deconstructing yourself and then reconstructing yourself. Because for me, I'm like, that's what transness is. That's really what blackness is, if we want to talk about it. But I don't think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, listen, that, I, listen. Um, I don't think I don't know if the community at large um, is ready for that conversation. But that's mm -hmm. definitely what transness is, um, and transness does. So yes, I definitely agree with that. Um, thank y'all so much. Now, storytelling. What role does storytelling play in the work that y'all do? Because while you may not be explicitly telling stories, um, mm -hmm. I do believe that storytelling is central um, to each of the, you know, to each of us in our work. So um, where would you say that that shows up for you? Well, the, the thing is, especially when talking about our, um, religious and spiritual uh, experiences, they aren't, or they aren't written many places. They aren't cataloged many places. So, you know, if it feels like 
we have no traditions to come to come from at the time besides the larger cishet uh tradition in the black spiritual church community um so i think storytelling when we're able to hear um, each other's stories. We hear these intersections where we have these same experiences, whether they're good, bad, or whatever. But um, in that recognition, in those, in the storytelling, when we see each other and see that we aren't isolated in our experiences, um, that is so powerful. That is so transformative. Um, and yeah, storytelling has just been so critical because it, it it's a place where you can see mirrors of yourself and you can see reflections of people that you didn't know were there before, or ex you can see experiences that you thought were just your own and felt so isolated in um, and aren't, yeah. Yeah, I feel like um, storytelling. Okay, so a part of my undergraduate bachelor's degree at Hampshire College, Lord Jesus, I don't even want to say the name, but no shout outs, they crazy. But like one of the things that I will say is like I studied oral history and oral tradition of enslaved African people in um, African people on the African continent, you know? And one of the things that I found that was so interesting within those histories, but also something that is crucial and important for me going forward in my own academic studies, in my life, in my career, just in like, you know, my community and day-to-day -day, like interactions is how like um, oral history is really the fulcrum at which blackness comes into being, you know? Um, and it really is like, like I could remember, I, I, okay, so I've been one of those kids who sit at the literal, I, I sit at the, I sit on the floor and I literally watch my grandma tell stories all day, you know? And I'm one of those people who love listening to elders tell stories about the world, about their life, about things. I could sit there for days, you know, just listening to that. And I think like the biggest reason why is because it gives so much texture to life. It gives so much history to the world. And so for black trans women, I remember there has been like, uh, you know, I, I feel like one of the things that I've noticed a lot in media is how like um, black trans women's stories are being told in ways after they die, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things I dislike about that is that black trans women never had, the, the black trans women who have been murdered and assassinated didn't have the chance to tell their stories why they were here, you know? Like no one asked them about their stories and maybe somebody have, and you know, maybe, so it's of course always exceptions, but like, I think one of the things that I strongly dislike is how the world assumes who I am and who people who experience the world as I do or differently, how they define our stories for us. And I don't like that because for me, every single body growing up in the black tradition in my house, like everybody told their stories. My grandma told her story. My mama told her story. My great grandma boy told her, told her story. Everybody told their story. So it's unorthodox for me to like get into a space where people all across the world is just saying, oh, well, black trans women experience this, black trans women experience that, black trans women this, black trans women that. I said, you don't know me, <laughs> not at all. So you will have to sit that one out, Miss Man. Anyways. And, yeah. and, you, and you know what? I think you, you brought up such a powerful point because you know that is what happens when cis people get in charge of our narratives and in charge of our storytelling transness gets reduced to death, gets reduced to our deaths. Those are the only stories that are being told. Um, and it, it becomes a currency for, for people to make money off of, for organizations to raise money. Off I love that. For um, media people to make campaigns where they make money off of. Um, so our deaths and our deaths become uh, currency and transness is, is reduced to death because cis people are so in charge of storytelling for black trans people. For me, um, storytelling is literally, you know, everything that I, the work that I do is storytelling. Um, I wanted to make sure 
the stories that these women were telling, you know, through their performance, through their, their look, through who they are, I wanted to make sure I could tell those stories. And I wanted to make sure that the world knew how vital and how important those stories were. Um, I think storytelling is for trans, especially for trans folk, I feel like storytelling is uh, in our existence. It is our existence because we, we come from a space of, like, um, like like he said, we come from a space of deconstruction, you know? So that within itself is a story. I feel like storytelling will be the key to, to our liberation. I feel like just everything that involves our life and what we do and life after death, life, while we're here, that that within itself is a story. Regardless of what we do, the work that we do, everything is a story and everything is everything needs to be documented because we don't have we don't have many spaces of history and many spaces of life that we can go to. Thanks. <laughs> I love everything each of y'all said. Um, <laughs> Also, I just want to, I did put it in the chat, but I just want to share with folks in the audience. Um, we are going to be going over time a little bit. Obviously, it's 501. Um, so if you do need to dash and you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And we definitely appreciate y'all for coming and for rocking with us. Um, back to the questions. Um, my next question is, what does the future look like? Based on our experiences. That's a big question. <laughs> based on our experiences, um, based on the work that we have done, based on the work that we do, what does the future look like? And I could give y'all a little sneak peek. The, last, the next and last question that I'll ask is what would you like to manifest for our community, which is kind of the same, can be the same, mm -hmm. um, but I like the power that what does the future look like holds because that gives us, um, you know, that gives us the power to enforce what our future will look like. Um, well, for one, I would say I, I, I feel like the future is beauty. Um, while there, there is struggle within transness, there is struggle throughout daily life. I feel like we, as Black trans people, we know that there were, there's no place that we would rather be, that life is possible for us, life it's sustainable. Life um, will give us the, fr the freedom, the courage, the opportunities, the, the space to create and the space to live. I feel like the future is beautiful. I feel like there is so much possibility for, for us, for all of us, for trans people. You know, um, we, we spend so much of our lives recreating ourselves so it's possible like anything is possible i feel like now like it's possible <laughs> i want to quickly chime in because i think my phone might die um uh so and I, and I might answer a little bit of the manifest question too just in case um but one of the things that i will say is that the future it what the future looks like to me is so to me black trans women is a unique experience in our world you know it's a very unique experience amongst a, a group of people in our world but it is definitely a part of a larger experience as it pertains to my work around environmental science sustainability in the future of earth you know and so what does it mean for black trans women to be envisioned in the future it means for us to be I mean, in all honesty, I would love, 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 love if there were Black trans women civilizations, Black trans women cities, Black trans women worlds, where Black trans women existed together, where we didn't have to fear all of these intense, crazy things that exist in our outside world, but that we can exist within a space where we can create, 
and build and design and perform and sing and dance and um, eat food and cook food and, you know, uh, have amazing, beautiful cookouts every day uh, for the rest of our lives whenever we wanted to, drink whatever we wanted, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm about to try that Ciroc when I get up to Massachusetts. I'm about to, you know, get me some of that Taylor Port and that sweet tea. You know, all a series of things. You know, I want to exist in all of my capacity at all times, at all costs, without there being a death of, you know, planetary destruction, without there being violence lurking over my shoulder. I want to live freely, you know, and I want to invoke freedom every time I move, you know, every time I walk onto any platform, any world, any stage, anywhere. You know, I want to be able to live in my truth all the time without being dictated about how I should and shouldn't exist, you know? But on that note, my I, my phone will probably die and I'll be the ending of me being on this panel. So I do want to say it was so good talking to y'all. It was so, 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 so good. Noel, beautiful, always air up and I'll follow you on Twitter. And Desi, I love you. You are so cool. You know, I have to talk to you about uh, uh, religion and uh, oh, this journal, this trans journal. You know, I try to publish in places. Child, these people are crazy. But I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to go on mute again. But thank y'all. Thank y'all for having me. We appreciate you, Boo. Yeah. And, and similar to what Daki was saying, to me, in a world that is so invested in capitalism, that is so invested in anti-Blackness, the best possible future is one where Black trans people get to be together, where we get to live together, where we, you know, ramp up our mutual aid to, you know, not just being like uh, various fundraisers on Twitter or small organizations, but that we would have entire network, mutual aid networks that we can just take care of each other and um, be invested in building a new world um, versus trying to make ourselves fit into one that mm -hmm. was never designed for us. Um, so I, I, I think a future where we can build together regardless of what is happening with the rest of the world um, is one I want to live in. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, for me, um, I agree with everything that each of y'all said. I also feel like for me, I always say that peace is the future. Um, I know that could be anything for anyone. For me in particular, I am a lover of water, like natural bodies of water. They bring me so much peace. Um, so that would be one example, like just having access to water, being able to like go to the water any and every time that I wanted to, um, which may seem small for people, but like that's something that brings me peace. Um, not really needing to really like ask people for anything. I feel like that would be peace. Um, that may also be something that I need to deconstruct because is it natural for someone to live and not really need anything from anyone else? Um, I don't know. I don't have the answers. Um, <laughs> but not really needing, not really wanting, um, and just like not really being so closely surveilled by the state. Um, and you know, that sounds like I would have to like move to like outer space somewhere. Um, but even, well, they surveil that too. But even with that being said, um, I think for me, it's just like eternal peace, like just having peace and not, I hate it that when one bad thing happens, it's like, oh my gosh, like something else. Like, I don't want that to be the future. Um, and I'm declaring that that won't be the future for black trans women. Um, and that is also going to be the one thing that I manifest for the future for us is peace. Um, if anyone else would like to share one thing that you would like to manifest, that would be fab. Um, also, after this, we're going to open it up and answer the questions that was asked from the audience. Um, and also, I would like to remind everyone that's here, um, audience members, um, please fill out the sign the sign up sheet that was um, emailed to you after registering for the event. Those are very important for us to just keep track of things. Um, Soul actually just dropped the sign up sheet in the chat. So when you have some free time, please, please, please 
um, fill out that sheet for us. And yes, what is one thing that y'all would like to manifest for us? Well, for you personally. Um, for me and the community, I would say um, sustainability. Um, I want us to be able to sustain life. I love to say sustain because we have to, we have to hold um, possibility. We have to hold uh, opportunities. And I want to. I want us to be able to be comfortable, like I, like Octavia said, to be comfortable, content. You know, um, that's that would be the perfect life for me, and I feel like that would be the perfect life for all of us to be comfortable, to be able to do what we need to do, and not um, not have to worry about this and that and have to struggle. I want us to, to be comfortable and to be able to sustain and to be all of that. Um, I would just say resources. Um, I'm tired of my people having to ask for money on Twitter. Um, I just want us to have the resources um, to get each other surge, rent, whatever is giving, um, trips, whatever, safety, um, just resources, because they do not deserve that form of storytelling from us um, to have to bear our trauma to receive resources. So um, yes, resources, resources, resources. The girls need money. The boys need money. Everybody needs money. Have you on it? Thanks. Um, all right. So now I'm going to we're going to transition into um, the Q and A from the audience. Um, the first question that we have from Soul: um, What are some spaces slash experiences that have supported your self belief and confidence as Black trans women? Thinking of this in the context of community too, where you have where you have to believe in yourself enough to accept and receive help and care from your communities. My trans sisters. <laughs> right. That and also, um, I would say my mom, um, me and her relationship has gotten like so much better since mm -hmm. I transitioned, but also since we have an understanding of each other, because mm -hmm. it hasn't just been like, oh, I transitioned and it was peachy keen because that is not what it was. Um, I thank God for hope. I thank God for therapy. Um, and, um, I thank God for that relationship that I have with my mom because I can definitely um, count on her for assurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Um, oh, sorry. Go no, you, you're good, babe. Okay, no, I was just gonna say, um, I definitely think just having to um, write and doing, like working on my thesis, um, different things like that. I am working on the thesis and I want to name that I don't always have self-confidence and self-belief. Um, sometimes that is really hard in a world invested in um, my death, invested in me not seeing myself as desirable. But where the saving grace comes in is that um, I, I, if I, if I can't get to it, if I can't do it, I can trust that somebody in my community can, um, somebody. And I think that that's something that makes me, that makes me feel so much more confident about being black and trans because I think initially when I transitioned, um, there was so little support um, that it, it felt like a burdensome existence. But, you know, when I, I saw that there was so much community, so many other people like me all over the place, um, that really uh, that, that really helped me to be a lot more confident and feel safer, um, even if the safety is an illusion um, in community and all of that. I don't know why I kind of got emotional um, <laughs> at that, but I definitely agree. I definitely um, resonate with everything that you said. 
The next question we have is from Devine. Um, could you tell us more about what the storytelling looks like for each of you? Curious about the journal Desi is working on, how Noelle's archives are shared, and Daiki studies and worlds under the sea. Okay, so um, just more about uh, what I do and how that involves storytelling. So, um, Barroom was a space, well, is a space where Black trans women and gay men came to just exist without the, um, the outside gazes and the outside uh, opinions of others, um, the perception of others. And what's fascinating to me is that these young Black trans women came to this space and started a whole How can I say this? They started a just a um, inability. They started. In, they started. There are so many ways I could say this. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, they started a wave of of an ability that would transcend many decades and many years. Um, and I feel like they did all of this while existing and going out into the world and having to sustain their lives and you know do so many things just to get by and they did all of this and went on the floor and made history you know i feel like vogue um vogue is a way of life i feel like vogue is um it's a it's a it's a superpower you know and black trans women they they created this. They created the style that we see today. And I feel like they don't get enough credit, you know? So storytelling for me with that, I wanna be able to tell those stories of those women who did that, the women that, that aren't here anymore and the women who are here, I get, to, I get to tell their stories, you know? And the fact that I get to communicate with women who've laid the foundation for me and I, I get to tell their stories while they're telling their own stories. It's it's amazing to me. So storytelling is a way that I can give them their flowers when the world didn't give them give it to them. Also, something that I think is so fab about um, black trans women, aka femme queens, role in ballroom is that mm -hmm. like I've heard it on like countless occasions that like the goal was not even to create a movement. Like the goal was just to like make space and take space. Mm -hmm. And then so much was birthed from that. So I think that right. that's beautiful. Right. You know, I feel like um, the world itself, not even barroom, but the world doesn't give uh, black trans women their credit. You know, we, we, are, we are a blueprint for deconstruction. We are a blueprint for how to exist without the without the perception and the opinions of others, you know, regardless of what we do, that within itself is a blueprint. So I want to be able to let the world know that I want to be able to storytell and to do that. So that's how storytelling goes into what I do. Um and about the journal, um, black people, black cis people, um, if we added black cis people and black trans people together, um, they are already a minority in higher education publishing. Um, and then when you get to black trans people, um, the number shrinks even further. Um, so when starting this journal, that was one of the things that was most important to me is to have a resource for us to publish our research and publish our work um, that will be peer reviewed and can actually support us in our academic career, support us if we want to go on to teach or um, if we want to get a, a book deal or something, but to have something to point to and say, Hey, I was I was published in this journal and it's peer reviewed. Um, 
and all of that. So that is uh, with that journal. And it's just, it's just about being able to expand um, the way our stories are being told. Um, it's going to be a multidisciplinary journal. So um, there'll be STEM, there'll be art, um, religion, philosophy, all of these things um, solely focused on what it means, well, through a Black trans lens. Um, and that is something that has been so lacking um, a space for us to theorize. And um, we are also committed to prioritizing people in outside of the academy as well, um, meaning that you don't have to have a certain education level to be published. You just have to be able to do the work um, and to be able to do the research in um, which most people can, they don't have to have a degree. So um, that is the journal, um, which we are so excited to get off the ground. So stay tuned. <laughs> I'm excited. Same, I was literally about to say the same thing. Um, I'm so excited actually for both y'all. I'm excited for all of us. Um, also for a bit about Daiki's work, you know, I can't speak for my sister, but she's not here right now. Um, but I did drop a link in the chat um, about some of her work. It's, it talks specifically about a paper that she's the co-author on. Um, and they talk a little bit about um, a design session, which is part of um, that trip to Philly that me and her were both on. Um, she was doing some work with other folks who she was in school with at the time, um, basically seeing like what technology um, Black trans people need, what technology Black trans women need, and if that technology technology exists without you know the veil of surveillance, um, and if it doesn't, then creating it. Um, so she's definitely like someone who has been like very, very essential for me um, in these conversations around what the future looks like for Black trans women. So I would definitely check out that link. Um, but yes, I'm so, I'm so warm right now. I'm so happy. I'm so joyful that y'all were able to join us today. Um, if all hearts and minds are clear. Oh, also Desi and Noel, if y'all could, um, or if you feel inclined to share whatever, um, whether it's social media, whether it's email, whether it's website, um, feel free to drop that in the chat just so folks can stay up to date with y'all. That'll be fab. Um, again, a reminder, please um, do sign the, fill out the sign-up sheet. It's very short, it's a very short um, sign-up sheet. Um, Yes, and without further ado, I'm going to close the panel out. Um, this has been, this has been the highlight of like my month, literally. Um, so thank y'all so much. I appreciate y'all so deeply. And I know that the future, um, the future is definitely going to be a bright one. So I'm very excited to be on this journey with y'all. Um, alongside y'all and I appreciate y'all and I love y'all so much you know um, I love you girl <laughs> thank you thank y'all of course also um, we're gonna be around a little bit but I'm gonna we're gonna um, replay the informational slideshow which played before um, and you know just for folks if you need any resources anything that's listed on there also if you don't see something if you're in need of something and you don't see it listed like feel free to get in contact with me um my email i can drop in the chat um i can also drop my social just because i'm that girl like i'm real you know i'm real banji <laughs> but without further ado um thank y'all so much for joining this has been fab and yes please like more power to y'all and do something nice for y'all selves thank seriously you. all right i love y'all have a great one love y'all y'all have a great day L-L-L-D. Hi, I'm Nate Turnerman. D O U R N A M E N T. D O U R N A M E N T. D O U R N A M E N T.
I can be your fantasy Low key, bust the tea I can be your, I can be your high key Come in me I can be your fantasy I say low key, bust the tea I can be your, I just need your I can be yours, I just need you I can be yours, I just need you I, 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 I need, I need, I need you Whenever I'm alone with you You make me feel like I am whole again Whenever I'm alone with you oh, You make me feel like I am Thank you.